Okay. Well, I have started recording now, so I will I will go ahead and start with um, the introductions and such. So I'm uh, Dana Popke. I'm the farmers market and nutrition manager for uh, Growing Hope in the Ypsilanti Farmers Markets. Um, this is uh, making more at market, simple ways to sell more product uh, uh, in our spring workshop series with uh, Erica Tebbins hosting for us. Um, uh, a bit about Growing Hope to get started. Uh, Growing Hope is an Ypsilanti-based nonprofit and we do a lot of um, work in various areas of the food system locally. We have four main program areas. One of uh, one is farmers markets, which I run. We have uh, two farmers markets in Ypsilanti and we've just started in partnership with some other folks uh, an online farmer's market called the Ipsy Area Online Market. We also have a farm, our farm and garden programs. Uh, we help folks start gardens at their own homes. We do um, all kinds of uh, stuff on our uh, urban farm in Ypsilanti. We grow food for our programs um, and all kinds of farm programs. We have uh, youth in schools, our youth in schools program area. So we do some uh, policy work around school food and nutrition. We do some after school classes. We hire teens in the summer and teach them about gardening and nutrition. And then we have our food entrepreneurship uh, branch of Growing Hope. So we have an incubator kitchen where folks can come and rent the kitchen to make uh, products where that they, if they need a licensed space. And we also do these um, free workshops in the spring and the fall with a variety of guest speakers talking about um, topics like making more at market or cottage food law or um, other licensing issues. So uh, it's really a range and you can, um, uh, this is, we're, we're near the end of the spring workshop series, but um, this, is our, this is our first online series. So you can catch uh, most of them. If you see Growing Hope's uh, Facebook page or the Ypsilanti Farmers Market Facebook page, a lot of the classes are posted there. Um, and as soon as we figure out how to make that work, we'll post them on YouTube as well. So um, that's, that's all about Growing Hope. Um, and I will let Erica introduce herself and we'll get started with making more at market. Erica, thank you for being here. There we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, awesome. It switched off to mute. Uh, thank you, Dana, for having me. And thanks to Growing Hope as well. Um, so I am going to share my slide. All right, you can see that, yes? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, there we go. I'm just going to move my little talking head up there. Uh, so yeah, so I run a business called Erica Tebbins Consulting. Um, I typically in in my regular business life i do um, business strategy and coaching for uh usually women and gender expansive entrepreneurs um, but i'm also the co-creator of the farmers market success system course um, with farmer and farm educator michael kilpatrick uh, and i am also a former uh, farmer and market stand manager so uh, a long time ago, I worked for um, Michael Kilpatrick um, when he was farming in upstate New York. Um, he ran Kilpatrick Family Farm. Uh, it's kind of funny because a lot of people in the farming world know him and they're like, oh, you know, he's sort of like, I don't know, this like micro celebrity in that, in that world. But to me, he's just my good friend. Um, and I started uh, working with him um, back in about 2009, and I just worked for him at the market on uh, Saturdays and Wednesdays. And I have a background in um, retail and uh, retail management and also like sales and marketing. So I had some suggestions on things we could do to help us sell more at market. And luckily, he was open to hearing those ideas. And so um, we ended up 
uh, I worked for him for about four or five years and we ended up growing um, the revenue for his farm year after year after year. And the, and the vast majority of their sales came from farmer's markets. So we did uh, two different farmer's markets um, year round as well. And it was uh, organic vegetables primarily um, is what we is what we had. So I am going to, let me just uh, hit present really quick on this, and then we'll get into it. Okay. So what we're going to be going over um, tonight is uh, creating a stall design that converts lookers to buyers by applying um, psychology and design principles. Uh, design, how to design signage that educates, makes uh, it easier for the customer and builds trust. And um, I know because people are having to move things online a bit right now, uh, I will also be happy to talk about um, writing descriptions for online stores. The good news is, is it's relatively the same, but um, having good descriptions really helps. Um, and then having a customer service plan that increases customer satisfaction and promotes repeat business. So a lot of this um, is actually taken from the entire second module of the Farmer's Market Success System course, which uh, is a course that basically takes everything that Michael and I figured out together and then packages it all up for anyone who sells at Farmer's Market. So we are going through most, not all, but most of um, module two, which is convert in that course. So stand layout. So this was a picture towards the end of when I worked for Michael of our beautiful stand. As you can see, he grew a lot of stuff. So we're gonna talk about first look, flow through the stand, hot corners, um, using all this space, even vertical, and the importance of colors. So selling starts with the eyes. So people make split second, decision, split second decisions based upon what they see. So it, the, like the data is about three to five seconds, is that we make a decision in about three to five seconds of if we are going to be more interested and approach, uh, you know, whatever it is, whether it's at the farmer's market or in a boutique, so you really have to make sure that as people are walking through the aisles that they um, really like sort of be are like enticed initially before they even approach and start looking really closely. So high quality, high quality presentation is possible and it's actually easier than you think. And the good news is, is a lot of the stuff that I will be sharing tonight is not stuff that you have to go out and spend a ton of money um, on. And obviously right now uh, with markets not being in person, you have a little bit more time to uh, plan your strategy around this too. But if you're taking pictures for an online website, this is still helpful. Okay, so first look. So we have our, our farmer person here. So you'll notice there is the primary banner um, up above, obviously this is more for when a market is outside and you have um, that tent above, but there's all different ways that you can uh, do other signage too, like Vistaprint makes um, stand up signs and, and different things that are vertical. And then uh, you can see the secondary banner back there as well. We'll get into a bit more about what those are and why they matter in a second. Um, you want to use the full height to show everything that you have. So imagine somebody's walking by, they're going to see your farm name. And if you have like a tagline or a motto, they're going to see that here. They're going to see uh, everything all the way from here to here. Secondary banner, I already mentioned that. There is some checkout space right there. Uh, these little green things can represent hanging signs or scales. And it's nice, everything is nice and uh, clean, organized and beautiful. So it's all tidy. So now let's get into it. So 
in terms of the uh, first sign, second sign, when I talk a little bit more about signage, I will uh, go a little bit deeper in it. But this is what it is like in, in real life, in like a real world scenario. So Providence Hill Farm, there is their tagline, and then their secondary signage. Uh, it also works a bit like a screen uh, in the background, and it keeps your attention inside of their booth. Like you can see it has a little bit more info there about what they are all about. Here is a different stand. So for people who don't sell, uh, who don't sell veggies, these are obviously some flowers and she has, she's using uh, height here. You know, it, there's no like um, canopy over her for her big signs, but fresh cut flowers. She has the um, large $8 bouquet sign and she is using height. She's even sitting up in a, like a high director's chair. So let's talk flow. And just so you know, because with doing this all online rather than in person, so in person, I was gonna sort of build stuff out and show it to you in real time. Instead here, I have lots and lots of real um, actual photos to show you of different vendors setups. And we'll talk about that. So in case you're worried about not being able to see it, what it would look like um, played out in real life, don't worry about that because I have plenty, plenty of photos to show you. So you want to, before the season even begins, you want to map out your stand and map out how people are going to move through your stand. And I have a few different examples of different size stand, stands here. Um, but you'll notice uh, here, so this is checkout. So this is where you would be standing behind here. Um, we just call this purse area, but you can also think of it as like market basket area. Uh, you want to be able to leave a little bit of room for people to actually put down their stuff. This is a great place if you have email sign up, you can have a clipboard right there. And then this is an aisle and this is an aisle. So people are either going to be coming through from one of these points and walking through. So I already talked about purse room. So you want to be careful of what is called butt brush. And this is uh, especially something to be mindful of in um, smaller stand areas. You want to be sure that you have it laid out in such a way that people won't worry about having to scoot tightly past each other because it's one of those things where we, I mean, especially now after all of this, like people were already, like we kind of liked our personal bubble of space around us. So if people feel like an area is too crowded, they are usually um, unlikely to want to enter that space. And have, uh, have actual like checkout areas, even if you have, let's say a larger stand in the summer months where you can have somebody that is wandering around floating uh, with maybe like a, a pouch with money on, um, you still want to have a designated, um, at least one designated checkout area. And then one thing that is helpful to do as well is to step back every so often and just watch the flow of people moving in and out. Because when you are watching what people are doing, it actually becomes easier to figure out you know, is there, uh, is there something that is like obstructing them? Is there something they keep moving around? Is there something that they're actually not noticing? And it can just help you make a better, a better stand. So this was um, us out at the Kilpatrick property, uh, very cold, probably March or April in upstate New York. And we would test our whole display outside uh, before we even went to market. And then we would see what worked, what didn't, we would take photos of it, we would take notes. And then that way, those first few weekends at market, we were just ready to go. And it was nice and we didn't have to feel frantic and mess with it there. So this was our large stall in Saratoga Springs. So um, this was the pathway, one pathway for customers to uh, get into the market. And then this was the side that faced into the market. So we had um, our, I'll talk more about our round table, but we had a round table here, a six foot round. 
And then we would keep a four foot table uh, right here at the corner. I have, I think the next picture is a, a long view of this. Um, and then we had, this is where employees would stand back here and we would have the checkout. And then there was another table. This was usually our table for uh, CSA member pickup. There's the sidewalk along the front of the market. Um, these were usually like larger bins um, that we would kind of stack higher up full of like melons or we would put um, sandwich board signs out here as well. And so I'll show you what this looks like underneath. So this is that long view looking back towards the checkout where we would stand. So this is really just, it's a bunch of um, tables and boards per perpendicular to each other. And then this upper shelf. Again, I'll talk about that a, li a little bit more as we get into it. But one thing to notice is you'll see that there are different colors and textures of how we have things laid out here. And we have extra storage behind um, where we are standing. So this is that six foot table right here. You can see that is the employee area, uh, our CSA manager back there, and this is our checkout and then a, our um, sandwich board out front. So let's talk hot corners and hot spots. So this is part of that display initially. So anywhere where you see a star is called like what we have dubbed a hot corner or a hot spot. So as you stand back and you're looking at your stall, think about where people's eyes are drawn to immediately. So what are they going to notice first? And how can you break up your stand so that you have more of these key hotspot areas? Use color and texture to break up your presentation. And again, step back every so often and watch. So if you can imagine, so this right here, that gray area is actually a secondary level. It's like these right here are um, upturned wooden crates. So uh, this and this are basically, they would be at eye level, whatever is on top of them. Anything on the corner here, on the corner here, because this is where people are walking by. So that's what they're gonna notice first. And again, up there. So if you had a corner stand, a not so great idea would be something like this. So the bins look dirty and they're broken. They are right on ground level. They're like, even these could be consolidated into one. People could uh, easily trip over them. If, if this is a market that allows people walking dogs, dogs could pee on them, right? So we don't, we don't want that. Instead, a great idea, even if you're not right directly on a corner, but would be something like this, something where it is um, nice and elevated. And this would be, this is a perfect hot corner. Because even if this person is sort of midway in the market, somebody is going to be walking by and they are immediately going to see these. And you could see right there, $15 bouquets. Somebody could just grab it, go up and pay for it and keep walking along. So you want to make it, um, you want to make it so that it's something that pops, that uh, people see when they walk by, that gets their attention and make it really simple and easy for them to say yes to that purchase. So this was our Glens Falls stand. So uh, this was our slightly smaller one in a slightly smaller community. But this picture shows um, where our hot spots are. So we had this front table right out front. So we would typically put whatever was something that we wanted to move a lot of. If it, let's say we either had uh, large quantities of it, or if we had, um, like if it was the first week at first, you know, one or two weekends at market with that crop, we would put it there so that it would fly out. So we have um, bins of sweet potatoes and root crops over here with our uh, certified naturally grown sign. And then we have um, broccoli spilling out on this corner hot spot. And then over here we have uh, cat grass and some squash. So any of those uh, places where people are walking by, those are things that we want to draw people in. 
so here I just have a few other um, like just ideas of uh, what you could do for stalls. If you had a 20 foot uh, stall, if you were going to stand um, back here, this whole thing could be like scooted back a little bit. Um, it's a little like just move too close to the front here, but you could stand um, behind here and then have tables that come out and those are your hot corners. And then this uh, and this are just elevated space. Let me know in the chat if you guys have any questions about any of this, feel free. Um, another alternative setup, again, you can see where the hot corners are. Um, and what we would do typically like with that Glens Falls stand, that table that is out front, um, we like to consolidate as we would sell down on things. So one thing that we might do, depending on our product levels, would be if we sold out of everything on that front table and we had an alternate product that we had a lot of or something we wanted to move, we might replenish that front table with something entirely different. Or we might just break down that table and then it would enable people to more directly approach uh, the larger portion of the stand. And then here are just a couple of um, alternative uh, 10 foot stands. So again, you kind of get the idea anywhere that's a corner, anywhere that's elevated, that's eye level and a corner, um, those are gonna be spots that are hot corners or hot spots. So often forgotten but important in your stand is space for personal items, purses, water, food, um, purchases, anything like that. Empty bins, uh, any back stock, any um, excess product uh, that you might have on hand, and any market tools like hand truck, scales, etc. cetera. So um, here is an example I'll show you. So this is obviously a very, very, uh, large farm production here because they have one, two, three, four checkout lines. Um, but you can see clearly here, they're under the table, they have empty bins. Um, back here, it looks like probably a compost bin for um, carrot tops. And then they have other crates and everything stacked up. So um, they probably could have moved this table back a little bit more and had room for more product out here. Uh, but just, you know, make sure what you really want to try to do is have tablecloths that hang down that block the customer's view of the back stock, and then try to um, keep all the surfaces and everything as tidy and unobstructed as possible, and um, just move everything else out of the way so it doesn't look, um, it doesn't like cheapen the look and feel of your stand. So does anyone have any questions on that first part. If you do, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, otherwise, part two is display assets. So designing your display. So obviously, you have to figure out what, you know, how much room you have and where you want your tables. And now we're going to go a little bit deeper. I sort of skimmed the surface uh, in part one on the stuff that you put out on those tables, but now we're going to go into a little bit more. So you want to build your stand with intention. So Whole Foods uh, and other um, stores, like uh, I know they don't have them in the Midwest, but where I had just moved from in upstate New York, uh, in the middle and Western parts of the state, there is Wegmans, which is like a huge, uh, really popular grocery store chain there um, that people absolutely love their displays. So. If you think about when you are at regular grocery stores and you think about displays that are really appealing to you, uh, definitely take pictures if you're inspired and you can copy them because the reason why I say you can copy them is that they spend millions of dollars on buyer psychology to figure out what is going to work and what won't work. And so there's no reason that you can't uh, do that for yourself, obviously within the parameters of being at a farmer's market. So we don't have giant cooler cases like this, but one thing I want to point out here is that they have everything broken up really beautifully from a visual perspective. So you have all your bins of roots, 
you have different things that are green broken up by bags of what look like uh, baby carrots and then all the way up and then they even stood these bundles of beets and greens um, on their ends on the top. So some things to keep in mind as you are translating this over to a farmer's market space um, is that you want different heights. You don't just want everything on a single plane. There are some problems with that, namely that, um, well, one, it's gonna be harder to catch their attention as they are walking by. And uh, two, it doesn't give you as much space to display all your stuff. And three, if your stall is busy and people are blocking what is on the lowest level, at least they would be able to, if somebody was walking by, they would be able to see what is on the upper levels. So uh, make sure that however, oops, ah, sorry guys, however you're doing it, that you have multiple levels and use that vertical space. Um, up here, you'll notice that there are two green items side by side, so scallions and arugula, and they are, but they are broken up visually by how they are packaged. So we have bunches next to bags. We also have microgreens, which again, they are in bags, but it's a different kind of bags. It's in a separate wooden box. So it's very clear that this is something different. And they are in these grab and go little um, bundles with clear signage. We also have special promotional signage here. Um, we have products inside different containers and they are tilted forward. And be sure that you are always um, try to angle loose items like this toward the customer if it works for what you sell. This, you like right here, this just looks very like bountiful and very full. Uh, it's, it's important, especially with produce, um, you want things to look really abundant. Uh, if you have other stuff that is like, let's say pastries or cheese, you, you don't need to have this insane excess, but you also want to have multiple of each thing out because there's a weird um, buyer psychology thing that nobody ever wants to be the person to take the last of anything. So that's just something good to keep in mind. Um, you'll notice here, uh, this is my friend Robin's uh, farm. She does uh, veggies and flowers. But she has, um, right here you can see that she has vases and they are nice and clean and tidy and they are at all different heights. So one thing that I would say, and I'm, I'll talk about tablecloths in a little bit, I would have loved if her uh, table had just a solid white or black tablecloth that went all the way across um, just to have that nice like clean contrasting look to it but this looks really nice. It looks very clean, it looks very professional, and things are at different heights. So again, here's some more examples of using different shapes to break up your display. So again, we have a round basket here. We have rectangular boxes. It's a little hard to see in this picture, but these are wooden quartz. So we have some wooden quartz over there. We have different clamshells. Again, we're using multiple heights. To, to break things up. And then, as I mentioned before, this is our magic round table. So here's why it's magic. Also, these are, um, these were special tomato trays that we made, but, uh, you know, I'm sure you could, you could either find or create something similar if, if need be. So we used these tomato flats to create different vertical space to really break up the presentation. Uh, the red tablecloth down below, it really like it pulled people in. Our whole like aesthetic was um, sort of this deep burgundy red for the tablecloths. Uh, the rest are solid. And then this one had sort of like an Americana um, old like farmhouse print to it. If we, if we did it all over again, we would probably just stick with like gingham or, or white or something um, even more simple. But that is what we had. And um, we, grou uh, we grouped the similar varieties of tomatoes together and we had 
signage all over the place, as you can see. So these are, we have some um, recipe cards. We are big believers in recipe cards. And then we have very uh, clear signage all over the place. Um, we also had like a laminated tomato guide for anyone who has lots of varieties of something that really helped us. Uh, this is a different farm, um, Rose Creek Farm in Tennessee. As you can see, they are going really vertical. They have obviously lots and lots of tomatoes and radishes and hackerai turnips here but they've broken up even just the radishes here with the white. Um, they have broken up the green, as you can see, cucumbers here and what looks like giant basil there. Um, but even the way that it's presented, it's grouped in different ways, bundles, um, head lettuce, just, it just breaks up the eye. Uh, because again, one other little thing about buyer psychology is that like, we, when we scan, when we do that three to five second scan, the more differences there are, the more that our brain can actually register what we are seeing rather than if it's just a big sea of solid green. So another thing to keep in mind and part of why that vertical space is so important is that people are buying from their knee to their eye level. So this is my friend Carrie's stand in Oklahoma, and she does a really, really great job with her visuals uh, pretty much in every way. She has been a client of ours and a student of ours for a while, and she just does an incredible job. Um, so you'll notice down here, this was right before the market began, so she wasn't fully um, selling yet. So she has her back stock bin here and then these little curtains that can be pulled over the front. You can see her signage is really big and very clear. And even though she has a lot of green going on, she has it presented in all sorts of different ways and all sorts of different packaging. So you want to create this nice vertical wall uh, as we call it, obviously this can be done lots and lots of different ways, but this is really, um, this is really interesting because again, it's, you can see this woman standing right there from the knee to the eye. This is the range that we are looking at stuff. So again, you never want something so high up that people have to reach because they won't. And you never want something so low down that people have to really bend over for it either. But this is great. Uh, so yeah, so we have like, we're big believers in using um, boxes, baskets, shelves, whatever you need to do to uh, get creative on the height. We are not a fan though of something like this where it's all these uh, green plastic crates because if you'll notice in this, um, it's green and then the bulk of what they're selling is also green. So if you were doing the quick walk by, it would be really, really, really easy for your brain to just sort of register as almost like nothing. Like it just is like, oh, it's just lettuce. There's nothing that is really interesting that draws you in. This, and there's also no tablecloth or anything on the table. So this would be, uh, this could be a lot better if they just swapped it out for some wooden crates. And they could even take this whole upper level down if they wanted to and make um, these like levels one and two look more, more bountiful and then just put a nice clean tablecloth down. But their signs, at least their signage is really big and good here. So just some more examples for you again, in case you, um, you know, we know, I know not everyone sells just veggies. So here is a lavender grower. So even though it's all these different bundles of the same exact thing by having them at these different heights and in these different baskets it really breaks up the presentation and then you can see over here she's got some like body products and then here is some food items some hot sauces so again just all those different vertical uh, levels and nice signage and again there is so here that burlap. So this is what I was talking about with the, the lettuce and in that um, with the green crates. 
here they have burlap. We used to use a lot of burlap. It's nice, it's clean. It sort of fits the aesthetic, obviously, of, of farming. And there are two uh, levels there, and then they just put the excess on top. Um, one thing that you could also do if this was a display like yours, if you wanted to put specialty signage on the top to call things out, like the fact that maybe you take credit cards, um, if there are things you want to mention about how you grow, like if you're certified naturally grown or organic or, um, you know, made, you know, non-GMO, whatever it is, you could put lots of different signs up there uh, just as call outs for different things. And then here you can see, since I talked a little bit about um, back sock space, and I'll have some more examples too. This is really great. Like you can see uh, this person has little baskets, uh, a Sharpie, some bags, and some scissors. So this is on the side that the customers can't see, but she has her little, her little area right there. Um, this is an example of, you could see they have their sign, they have, you know, who they are, where they are, their tagline. That is all really great. They are doing it from knee to eye. It looks really bountiful. They're using different um, baskets and different things to break it up. The only thing I may have done differently here is, um, is get some different uh, tablecloths. The, this looks a little bit torn in some spots and also because there is a lot of green and they have some other uh, colored products to just sort of break that up a little bit, a little bit more just so, um, just so your eye can travel over it a little bit better. But overall, great. And they have uh, very clear signs on each of their items, at least on this top row. So this was um, back to our uh, Glens Falls stand. You can see a better, um, a better view of those grab and go wind crates. And this back here where the eggs are is, uh, that is our shelf that is made up of, it's just some wooden crates flipped upside down and then boards across. So this is all really like low tech, uh, just, um, regular like pieces of lumber and crates and the crates we actually would use to transport all of these empty wooden boxes in and tablecloths and everything. So everything for us did double duty because we didn't have, um, we had a lot of product and a lot of supplies and we didn't have giant semi trucks or anything. So we had to have economy of space. Uh, this is a backside view. So if this is something that you want to copy for yourself, you can see there are the tables and there are the wooden boards and here is all of our understock. So what we would do for the root crops, especially um, grab and go is really, really, really good in terms of selling more because again, in the essence of making things as simple and easy on your customer as possible. This is actually easier than weighing. So people have a really hard time conceptualizing what a pound of something is. And we feel like we are busier than ever, especially now as um, markets that are open, like a lot of our uh, clients and students, they um, do have markets that are open and there are different policies now so it's easier for uh for you to just sort of if somebody says like i want a box of carrots to just dump it in a bag and hand it off rather than have to scoop out a certain amount of carrots and weigh it so you can actually sell way 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 more the more um, grab and go you do versus um by the pound and then so we would just take these and then as they um, as soon as somebody would take some, we would just refill it back up and keep that whole area looking really full. So some things with tables and tablecloths. Um, so you can see there we have uh, the burlap. You can see right here our tablecloth goes pretty much all the way to the ground. You can kind of see that little bin peeking out. Um, the only one, it, like later on when we were able to get more of this cloth, we actually did have a tablecloth that covered all of that. But again, you want to just have your tablecloths look as like clean and tidy and um, covering whatever is underneath as much as possible. Uh, one thing that 
if I had to do this over again, I love this middle table, but with these um, squash in the middle, I would have put more, like I would have upturned another uh, crate in the center and then put those on it just to have some more height. Um, so yeah, so most, uh, mostly we were using um, folding four and six foot tables with those are just the, the boards that we would lay perpendicular and again, the round tables. So here is another um, round table. You can actually get um, specific tablecloths for these that fit really nice. Now, um, this is, it's great that they have this table. The only thing, the reason I included this picture is just because um, things here could be grouped just a little bit better to give it a slightly cleaner look for, uh, for people walking by. And then as summer comes around, you, if, you know, if you need to, uh, a lot of times people get worried, especially with greens about things, um, wilting, but we recommend, um, if you can get some nice white screens, you want to go for white if at all possible, because it allows filtered light and you don't want your um, your stand to be too dark. Same thing with the canopies. If you are ordering new ones, um, we, I always suggest white uh, because it looks really clean and it allows enough um, natural light through. Uh, screens or these signs, like how I had mentioned um, with Providence Hill before, this actually keeps customers' eyes within your stall. So the more that they are focused, uh, in your stall, the more that they will purchase more from you. Uh, so it's just a little bit more um, info on the stalls. And if you have, to, or on the screens, if you have to, you can also use um, white shower curtains. And then another thing that you can do, as I mentioned earlier with the with our tables, is you want to keep moving crops into progressively smaller containers as you sell down. So to keep with that idea of th making things look really bountiful is that you can just keep adjusting your display as things sell out. So that way uh, you give the impression of things being really bountiful and full. Also, if you have, especially if you have a bigger stand, um, you know, if, if you just have a one six foot table. Um, so when I had, I had a micro farm and I sold at our local farmer's market, it was a very small market. I only had greens and herbs. So I didn't have a huge stall. I did not need baskets. I didn't need any, like there wasn't a whole lot of room that people had to shop. Um, but if you do have a larger stall, uh, one thing that is nice is um, having some baskets because if again for buyer psychology if people have their arms full and they want more they won't actually keep taking more unless they have a place to put that so if they don't have their own bag on them or if the bag that they brought with them is already full of other purchases they will stop shopping uh if their arms get too full so if you do if you do have a larger stand um you can get a few of these uh fairly inexpensively so does anyone have any questions on that so far? Yeah, I'm happy to move on. I see that Linda hopped in here. Linda is one of our one of our students. She's awesome and just happens to live in Michigan. Um, so signage is super, super, super important. I'm gonna take a sip of water really quick. So there's a lot of I uh, like a lot of times people will wonder, do I need to have prices on everything? Can I just have one big sign that shows, you know, all of the things I have and all of the prices? Um, and depending on what it is you sell, um, you know, if you have to keep everything in one cooler because it's meat, uh, there are some different ways that you can do it. And I have some examples in here. But otherwise, if you have set, like smaller items, if you have produce, um, anything like that, you really do want to have a sign for each thing. So as I mentioned earlier, I was going to talk about the primary and secondary sign. Again, 
So one thing we get into more in the farmer's market success system course um, is that you are not really there to necessarily be marketing to everyone. You are marketing to the people who are most likely to, um, to be a customer, to be an ideal customer of yours. And that because of that, your messaging is really important. Your whole like brand holistically, it really matters. So in this instance, it's probably a little hard to see, but they have um, this, this thing that says, uh, join the conspiracy for real food, no herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, GMOs, like you can see all of that. And then over here, yes, low till, no till. Um, like, I think it says like certified naturally or no compost and rich soil, like all these different things. So these people are clearly targeting folks who already care about this stuff or people who are curious about learning more about this. So their signage, their larger signage right from the get-go before we even get to prices, it already uh, is going to attract a certain type of person to their stand. So price signs. This is uh, in a pretty much two scale version of our price signs, um, slightly larger, but we, we did have pretty big uh, price signs. So we would always include what it was, our logo, um, a very obvious price, some CSA info, uh, and then a descriptor, and we would laminate these so they wouldn't get uh, too beat up at market. So now as you are um, maybe temporarily, hopefully temporarily moving some stuff online, it's important here you'll see, you know, great in salads and sandwiches, uh, a green with a bit of zip. So what is important to know is that even though you might know, like, you know, I know arugula, I grow arugula, you know, who doesn't know arugula? A lot of people might not. They might not realize that it's peppery. They might not realize, like, they might think, you know, do you have to cook it? Can you eat it raw? Can you do both? Um, so it's always a good idea to assume that the person coming across your item online doesn't really know what it is or what to do with it. So you don't need to write a novel, but it is important to give a brief description and also, um, you know, tell, tell them what they can, uh, can use it on and also include recipes if possible. Um, again, we're big believers in empowering people with recipes. Um, so this one, this is a really, really, really great description, right? So this is, this is awesome, but it doesn't look great how they have it displayed because it is just on a piece of cardboard. So it's a little hard to read and there's also no price on there it's really, really, really important to have prices on there because people will not ask and, or generally don't like to ask. And again, anything else that is going to slow down a sale or put up a barrier for people uh, is going to cost you in the long run. So this is really great. <clears throat> this vendor, again, they have a uh, grab and go, really, really simple. Um, they're not making you, you know, weigh anything out. You can just dump it right in your bag. And it's really clear. $5 a box, crisp, juicy, sugar snap peas, and there's a sale. Two boxes for $8. Crystal, clear, cute little signs. Um, when I, uh, because my operation was so small, I just used these cute little signs as well when I was farming. And they worked beautifully. So here is a great example. We get a lot of students who are like, I do dairy, I do meat. What am I supposed to do? Because I can't display any of my products. They have to stay cold. So uh, we really love this stand. Uh, these signs, obviously you can make them fairly easily yourself. These easel signs, they have some pictures up at the top. And then they're telling you right on there, pork, beef, chicken, and then they have the list, the prices, uh, they have right here, you know, there's a little bit more info about the chicken. And then as things sell out, they are crossed off. So this is great because maybe you got there late in the day and you're like, oh, you know, they had ground sirloin. 
I missed it. Okay, cool. Well, maybe I know to come back next weekend earlier and get it. And then they have their little, um, their little sign up spot there. So that is a great example of something that you can do um, if you don't have a traditional stand. And then some additional signage, um, obviously for uh, food producers uh, or like prepared food, uh, having a sandwich board sign does make perfect sense because it's more like a restaurant. Um, it's something that you're gonna have to look at and contemplate and order, uh, like place your order rather than grab something off the table and put it in your bag and then pay for it. So. Um, this is a nice clean sign here and then at some of the larger stands um, they have these uh, like these tall signs that stick out up above so that as you're walking around you can see them more easily you can see like you know oh it's a bakery and then walk toward it if you're interested in that some additional signage that we had um, we had uh, these different like for a, a little while um, Michael was uh, selling in some local stores. And so he created these labels with the QR code and he could just check them off really easily. So this would be great if you had like bulk bags of things and you wanted to put labels on them. And then we also had um, some eggs every now and then. So you could scan it. It would take you right to a page on our website that would talk about our chickens and our eggs. And we had additional info there for people. Here is another example um, of a meat vendor display um, where you can just see very clearly the sign. So if you're far away and you were walking by, you can see very easily, you know, pork, poultry, beef and lamb. It's bright, bright green uh, and really large. So easy to see to kind of hook, hook people in as they go by. So lastly, we are at customer service that sells. So before we um, get into this, just to recap, because I know this is a ton of information, the things that you really want to focus on so far are utilizing uh, all the space in your stall, especially the vertical space, because people buy from their knees to their eyes. So don't put two things too low, don't put them too high, put them in that mid range. You wanna break up what you have by different types of colors and textures. You want nice clean tablecloths that obscure whatever is underneath them. And you want really clean signage that clearly shows what it is, what the price is, gives people an idea of what to do with it, and all of that. Because all of this is going to be stuff where if you imagine if you are busy talking to somebody and you, uh, and you know, it's the peak of the market and you are hustling and you're trying to get through everyone as fast as possible, you want people to do most of their decision making before they even get to you. So you need to have um, various com all these various components in place. And, and I will say in case you're like, this is a lot and it's like, da feels daunting. Like you don't have to do everything right out the gate and have it perfect. You can test and tweak as the season goes on, but you want to have as much of this ready to go. Um, so that way people can actually decide and be sort of pulled into your stand and engaged with the product and excited to buy it before they even have to talk to you. So the interesting thing is, as we always think about like selling and customer service as something that happens, like that's like the starting point for a relationship, but with a, a new customer, but it actually isn't. We are already, a, a person is already deciding if they want to shop with you before they even talk to you. So you just want to make sure everything looks really great from the outset. So that way they do come into your stall and they do start looking at your product and they do start engaging with you because then you can use good customer service that really works and um, you can convert them into definitely buying something from you and possibly even spending more and then having a really good experience and coming back again and again and telling their friends. Okay, so they, you got them hooked on the display and this is where you get to work your magic. So this is what I love to really talk about the most. So in 
what I do and because of my, my background and my work is I love talking about sleaze free selling. Um, a lot of people really hate selling and there's a lot of misconceptions about selling. So I like to teach people sort of what it is and what it isn't and how you can do it better and how you can do it in a way that feels really, um, really good. So part of what you need to first do is be aware of your surroundings. So keep your head on a swivel and be aware of people coming near and into your stand. So don't get ca too caught up in chit chat or on your phone because it will cost you. So I know it can be hard when you, when, if it's like a slow moment and you are like, well, I'm just going to hop on social media for a minute and see what's going on. Obviously if there are zero customers around, it doesn't really matter. Um, but if there are people around the problem with, um, being seated and being on your phone is that it sends a signal to people that you aren't interested in conversing with them, which is probably not true. So my suggestion would be if there are any uh, shoppers in the area, um, unless it's really urgent, try to keep your phone away. Um, it's amazing to be able to chit chat with your neighbors, but if people start to approach, um, you know, turn and say hi to them. And also as much as possible, try to be standing or at least on like a higher up, um, like one of those like director's chair type things. Um, if it's hard for you to stand for long periods of time, again, this, this just all goes back to um, buyer psychology. Uh, greet people and ask, um, you know, hi, what are you looking for today? Or what can I get for you? Something positive and open-ended, even how is your day going with a smile is going to be really, really, really good. So we are used to, unfortunately, a lot of bad selling, a lot of high pressure selling. You do not have to do that. Uh, people know people who shop at a farmer's market, are fully understanding that they are going to have a different experience than if they go to Kroger or Meyer, right? They're going to have a much more personal experience. They're probably not going to be rushing. Um, they're probably making, you know, a morning out of it. And so it's good to, um, to chat people, chat with people, make them feel welcome, make them feel like, you know, Hey, I'm here, you know, whatever you need help with not in a pushy way, but just in a, you know, what are you looking for today? Because in the instance of this meat vendor, somebody might say like, oh, I'm thinking about making, you know, I don't know, burgers. Uh, and then you can say, oh, great, here's what I recommend. And, you know, or shish kebab or whatever. And then you can, as the vendor, you can direct them to what you think the best option is for them. And I love talking sales. So if you have any questions about you know, what you should say or how to say it, let me know. Um, also, one thing I love is uh, promos and the phrase, just so you know. So this phrase, I call it my magic phrase. Uh, many of our students in the course have said, like, I sold, you know, I've sold out of things that I couldn't ever sell out of before. I've, I had my highest day at market ever. Um, I had, you know, twice as many sales this Saturday as I did last Saturday, all because of this one phrase. So whatever you have going on, let's say you have jam and you're doing, you know, three for $13 today, let people know. So after you say, Hey, you know, or, you know, can I help you find anything today? Or what are you looking for today? If they say, Oh, I don't know. Like, I'm just, you know, I'm just looking around. You can say, awesome. Well, my name is Erica. Um, I make all of this myself with local fruit. And just so you know, all of the half pints are, um, they're three for $13 today. Something like that. Really casual, not high pressure at all. Um, and even if it is not a monetary promotion, even just letting them know, oh, you know, just so you know, all of our pastries are baked with fresh local organic ingredients that helps people understand too. Because a lot of times people don't understand um, the ins and outs of a specific farmer's market. Since farmer's markets can be really varied depending on where you are in the country, sometimes people think like, oh, well, people just 
bought stuff from other people and now they're like selling it at this farmer's market, they don't actually know that you made it yourself. So um, you can just, you know, educate people with the phrase, just so you know. And a lot of times that, again, it just keeps the dialogue going and it piques their interest. Um, and it's also good to, again, if they, uh, if their arms are really full, even if you don't have baskets, you can always say, oh, hey, you know, looks like your arms are full. Do you want me to take those? I can start bagging it for you if you want to keep looking around. And then you just keep a mental tally of what they already have or jot it down somewhere. And that way they can keep shopping. All of these things are things that are going to increase what is in the retail world called guest spend. So sometimes people, you will have told them, hey, this, you know, this is our promo. And then they are shopping and they get busy, they get distracted and they forget that you told them that, right? So let's say they bought two jams at $5 each, but they can get an extra for $3. They come up, they have two jams. Don't assume that they remember that you told them about your promotion. Instead, you can say, oh, you know, just so you know, you could get a third for only $3. And most of the time people will say, oh my gosh, that's right. You did tell me and I totally forgot. Or, uh, oh yeah, thank you for reminding me. Like, let me grab this other one. Every now and then, you know, people will say, oh yeah, I know, but like, I, I really, I'm not going to eat that much. And you can just say, okay, that's great. Like, awesome. Let me wrap this up for you. Um, but a lot of times it really is that it, it's not that people aren't interested. It's that they forgot or they didn't realize. So you can politely remind them. And then you want to thank them and invite them to take the next step. So the, an example could be follow you on social media, get on your email list, take a recipe card, take a sticker, take a flyer for an upcoming event, et cetera, whatever it is. So here you can see that, you know, there's that I mentioned before the email list. Um, you could always say like, hey, if you like while you're um, bagging up their stuff, hey, if you join our email list, we will send you a coupon for $5 off your next purchase or 10% off or, you know, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, or, you know, if you, uh, you know, like join, like follow us on Instagram, like I'll take a dollar off your order, whatever it is, you just want to, um, to let them know what the next thing is they can do in order to keep engaging with you and your brand. A simple way to remember all of this, because I know um, that's kind of a lot of steps, but again, welcome the customer. So when they approach your area, um, welcome them. Offer assistance. So uh, what can I help you find today? Recommend something. So just so you know, you know, today we have um, blueberry scones like uh, are back or, you know, we have fresh strawberries or whatever the thing is that you want to recommend know your stuff. So be able to respond if they have questions and make sure if you have any people that work for you as well, that they know or that they can find out. So if somebody, this would happen a lot, like people would, people who were like really nerdy about organic uh, growing would say, you know, do you, have these been sprayed with whatever? And a lot of times our, our staff wouldn't know. So we would have to find out from Michael, uh, who was, you know, worked on the production side. And eventually we had like a frequently asked question sheet that was just in our market binder that people could flip to, but know your stuff and then sincerely thank and invite them back. So, or invite them to take whatever next step. So last little bit in case you're like, all right, but what, what do I do when it gets really busy? Um, how can I follow that whole like works framework? So uh, there's an easy way. I'll give you like a little order of operations, but clients waiting to buy always get top priority. So the people who have been lured in by your beautiful display and you engaged with them and now they have their hands full and they are ready to check out, they always get your the, the bulk of your attention, right? Because they are ready to spend their money. So if you're in the process of bringing somebody up and somebody new comes into your stand, 
just say hi or welcome or even a smile and nod uh, goes a long way just to acknowledge that, that they are there. And then um, one thing you can remember is, so again, as ring up people who are ready to pay and then assist people who are still shopping. So if there's nobody that is ready to pay, then walk through um, or you know stand there and talk to them if your stall is small enough. Uh, assist them with whatever it is that they're looking for. If you have no shoppers um, at your display, you can take this time to refresh it, kind of like reset it back to how you would want it to be. This is a great time if you are selling out of stuff and you need to um, swap out those bigger baskets for some smaller baskets. Uh, you can do that now or break down a table or um, if any signs have uh, gotten knocked down, you can um, fix those and then you can do anything else. So that is really, um, those are the, the most important things to, uh, to consider. And if you have somebody with you, you will uh, make sure that they know the order of operations as well. And if you are ringing up somebody, like let's say you guys are both ringing people up um, and now you're down to that one person and you can finish checking that person out, then they would break off and they would assist the people who are still shopping. Then they would, you know, reflect, refresh the display and then anything else. So this can definitely be done in um, either solo or with a team. So um, the last thing, and then I am happy to answer any and all uh, questions is that right now our farmer's market success system course is not open for regular enrollment to the general public. Um, but we put up a special link and a coupon code for you guys, just for you guys. So if you want in and you want to save um, over $200 on the price of the course, we would love, we would love to have you in there. And on that page, it breaks down uh, a lot more of what's in there and, and what you get in the community and all of that. But that was what I wanted to share with you. I'm sad I didn't get to show it in person and sort of act out some different scenarios, but by all means, um, let's, let's open it up for some questions. Thank you so much, Erica. I think you're so welcome. I, yeah, this is so, so helpful. I, there's a number of vendors I can think of off the top of my head that I want to make sure I get this recording to. Um, <laughs> and all of those pictures of, uh, you know, summer market and bountiful produce. I'm like hungry and I want market season right now. I know. <laughs> very I know me too. It's very inspiring. Me too. I know it's like, uh, I, I love, I love summer market season. It makes me so happy. Um, but yeah, these, these are all really like, so we did, we first debuted this course, um, at the end of the summer last year. Uh, and we did this farmer's market challenge, which we hope to do again this summer it might be a little bit different just depending on how things play out, um, with COVID. But, um, but we gave people some of these tips, like the, the hot corners, the vertical display, the just so you know, um, and like some of the, the customer service stuff. And just over three days, people were like, I had my best day ever. Like, I can't, this, it feels like magic. And we're like, yeah, it's just, it's literally like, it's stuff that major companies do, yeah. even if they're not grocery companies. Like, uh, so I used to work for Calvin Klein and it's stuff that, that like we would do there and it's, it's just, they, people do it because it works and there's nothing that says like farmers at, or market vendors can't do the same. So you absolutely can, and you can totally put your own spin on it too. You don't have to sound super corporate or anything like that, but it really works. Um, and one other tip for promos that people often get wrong um, is people try to discount a lot for promotions. And we always recommend doing something that encourages people to buy more. So instead of saying like, let's just say, you know, all the 
wheat bread is 25% off, like we would say buy one loaf, get another loaf for half off. Because you always want to encourage people to take advantage of a discount where they would be buying more rather than this perceived value of your stuff is like worth a, a lower amount. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of the, the display stuff, especially the vertical, the thinking about verticals stuff um, with, you know, with COVID-19, there's a, there's a chance that I might ask vendors to not, you know, to move things back and not have customers allowed to touch things. And like the touch and the smell and that experience is a huge part of farmer's markets. And so really amping up the visual aspect, I think is gonna be really important. Um, yeah, definitely. Some of the ones that um, we've seen where people are currently allowed to be selling right now is where it's like a six foot table where people can like grab their stuff and then another six foot table up against it where the vendor would stand and usually it's you know they have like their square reader or whatever is like out there so that the person can swipe their own card um and then the product is actually on a table behind the vendor and it's displayed and so the person has to come up and say like i want a box of carrots you know or a bunch of carrots a bag of lettuce i want that like and just sort of tell them and then they have to get it and and yeah. package it all up. So yeah, so in that instance, like you would, as much as you could tilt things forward or stack things up or make things as easy as possible um, is going to help a ton. I will say on the plus side, we, from the, from the farmers who have been able to adapt, we've seen people who are like, cannot keep enough product in stock because people right now are really like, excuse the pun, but like they are hungry for safe, fresh local food. Yeah, we're seeing that a lot also. The online market that we launched, launched last weekend, I mean, was very successful for only having ordering open for a couple days. And I expect that to grow. And, you know, we are looking for more vendors for that because lots, lots of folks sold out of stuff. So, um, yeah, all of the, the venues that are, that are still open I, are, are doing really well. Yeah, so yeah, and that's, that is definitely like a really good sign. And I'm glad that people are already ordering um, in, in the, you know, just right out of the gate in the first week. And I know too, for people who are like, okay, but how, like, how am I going to let people know this is where having some sort of social media presence or email list, it just gets the word out to people about what you have and where they can even find it. I've been trying to educate my friends too, where I'm like, you know, buy local. And people are like, well, how can I buy local? My farmer's market isn't open. And I'm like, go to your farmer's market website. I'm sure there's something like, even if the market doesn't have a main like ordering page, look at the vendor list yeah. and then go to individual vendors like websites or social profiles and see what they are doing because a lot of them have moved online. So if you have Instagram or Facebook live, like you could literally set up some of what you have just in your home or outside, like as long as it's well lit and people can see it and you could walk people through what you have, you could take a bunch of photos, like you can put all of that out there. Yeah. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Um, from Brandon. I'm not sure if you covered it, but what is the best spot in your stand to place samples? Mm. So I actually actually took out, uh, we have in the course, we talk a lot about sampling because we are really big on it, but a lot of our students now are like, yeah, they straight up banned samples this year. Um, so samples uh, are fantastic and they absolutely increase your sales. Um, if you're allowed to do them, you want to put samples. Uh, so it's depending on your layout, wherever they are, you want it to be somewhere that you can kind of like monitor it just for, for like health and safety reasons, even in uh, non COVID times. So you want it in like a hot corner or a place where people are going to see it and notice it and want to try it. 
but you also don't like, if you are the only one working and your checkout is like many, many, many feet away from where it would be, you don't want that because like, you don't know what you can, it's like too far to see what's going on. So try to do, try to aim for a hot corner that is near you so that you can talk to people about it. Um, one of our students who joined um, our very first beta round, um, she makes pickles and low sugar jams and jellies in Oregon. And um, she, just from using like hot corners and sampling and just talking to people and saying like, hey, I make all this myself and it's low sugar and, and all of this, like her sales have, massively increased. Even now she is selling online and she's doing deliveries and she's shipping things out. Um, but just from, just from that alone, from having that dialogue from, she moved some of her largest pickle jars to a hot corner. Uh, and she was like, I sold all of them in like a single Saturday. And she used to have trouble moving even like a few of those jars, but she just, she had samples right next to him. So people could try it and then she'd say, yep, it's these right here. And people were buying them like crazy. It's great. Yeah. Um, one, I'm trying to think, I'm, now I'm blanking on her name. The woman at the Ipsy Market who sells the baked goods um, over on, was like, if you walked in the room it, on the left-hand side. Which we moved them. Uh, there was more, more baked goods. Um, Ginny. Yes. Talking? Yes. Her. Yeah. So her display um, was, I, I really like her display. Like she, and when I, the last time that I was at market, uh, I ended up buying some stuff from her and she did a really great job and she and I were chatting and she said she has a background in like regular retail as well. And I was not surprised because her tablecloth, I don't even remember like if it was white or what it was, but it was like beautiful and clean. I think she had some like burlap and then she had a uh, white like ceramic and also clear glass like platforms and trays and things at different heights. And then each of her things was packaged really beautifully with a bright pink bow and all the pricing was very clear and she was standing and she was talking and she said, oh, these blueberry scones, they just came out of the oven this afternoon at one o'clock. They're super fresh. Like she was checking all the boxes and I was like, oh my gosh, like you're so, you're so good at this. And I bought a bunch of stuff from her and I like, I was just so impressed. And so when she told me that she's retired, but her background was in um, like corporate retail, I was like, not surprised because you, <laughs> you are doing all of the things right. So she's a great example of like this process in action and, and how it, it plays out in real time and how it really works. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I can, there's definitely a couple of vendors that I can think of that like, it's like, especially if, if you put any effort into doing the vertical, like it's, it's just so noticeable. Um, yeah, I have a, another one of our vendors, um, Gretchen, who does checkbox bakery. She does our Saturday market in the summer. Um, she's put a lot of thought into her display and, and lifting everything up. One thing that she says about samples is because her, she has a fairly expensive ingredients uh, for her, her, her products. So she, um, to avoid like the the grazing, because mm -hmm. people kind of have like that Costco um, expectation. Um, she has a, a a list out and has things highlighted and says, "I have samples of anything um, that's highlighted." So if you'd like to try something before you buy it, um, let let me know. So because I she couldn't, and then you know passes anything out at the end of the market to volunteers and other market staff and makes a lot of sales that way. But yeah. Yeah, that's a really smart idea too, especially depending on what you have and and everything. Like I I think that that's a really good that's a really good idea cuz yeah, you don't want people just like going to town and eating all your samples and everything. Right. We would try um one thing that we would do cuz we would sample a lot is um we were always really big into collaboration with other vendors. So mm -hmm. If we had like, let's say if we had made, I don't know, like a dill dip or something, 
um, we would try to use dairy from a local vendor and we would try to use bread from another local vendor to sample. And so when we would have our recipe cards, it would actually like highlight those other vendors too. And so, and on our, like, we would have a whiteboard that would say what it was and um, like usually some call outs to those other vendors. And then, because we, we were like a big believer in the, the community yeah. aspect of like, Hey, you if you want to make this, like go across the aisle and get, you know, whatever from that person and get a loaf of sourdough down there from Rock Hill Bakehouse. And um, so that was always really fun. And then a lot of times, like if other vendors did it, they would do the same for us. Like they would yeah. collaborate with us. And uh, so, yeah, that's like a, that was always a really, a really big thing was like, how can we, how can we also help other vendors get their stuff sold with our stuff? Great. Yeah. Does anyone have any final, final questions for Erica before we wrap it up? Doesn't look like it. So thank you so much, Erica. Yeah. For You're welcome. Wow, uh, this um, is great. Yeah, and feel free if you, if anyone wants to uh, message me, I am, my Instagram is Erica Tevins Consulting. So you can just find me there and feel free to send me a message. I'm happy to answer any questions and look forward to meeting all of you guys in person, hopefully this summer. Um, because even though my, my primary clientele now is not farmers and farmers market people, I love still being able to serve them because it's, yeah, I just, I love, I love farmers markets and market vendors. And we love you back. <laughs> um, I will send out, um, to all the participants that signed up on Eventbrite, I will send a recording of this out um uh in a couple days once we once we get it all packaged together along with an evaluation that uh and that evaluation helps uh helps us inform the classes that we'll do in the future helps us learn about the businesses that are attending um and helps um helps us gain financial support for these classes so appreciate it if you could fill that out as as when i send that um and other than that i think that's it for tonight thank you all right Thank you. Bye.